I'm reading again from my book, Mind and Evolution, as assessed through reviews of major texts. A New Science of Life by Rupert Sheldrake, 1981. In the USA, this was titled Morphic Resonance, the Nature of Causative Formation. Morphic resonance refers to Sheldrake's theory that patterns of activity in one place can influence similar patterns in another place, even across space and time. For example, if a group of rats learn a new skill in one laboratory, then other rats of the same breed may learn it faster in other laboratories. Sheldrake thinks that this idea can explain how living things evolve and change their forms and behaviours through direct connections across time and space. I'm reviewing this book not for its use of morphic resonance to account for evolution, but for its opening chapters on how to organise one's thoughts on the subject of evolution's mechanisms and how to assess the ideas of others. What issues must any new science of life take up? In his first chapter, Cheldrake takes us through sections titled Morphogenesis, Behaviour, Evolution, Origin of Life, Limitations of Physical Explanation, Psychology and Parapsychology. Of evolution, he remarks that Quote, the neo-Darwinian theory can never be more than speculative, quote, end quote. And he issues this very acute observation, quote, evolution will always have to be interpreted in terms of ideas which have already been formed on other grounds. He warns us not to expect these grounds to emerge from the study of life's origin that he anticipates will tell us little about its subsequent evolution. More fruitful are likely to be challenges in accounting for behaviour. He illustrates these under the headings instinct, for example, a spider's ability to spin a functional web, regulation, that is the ability to substitute one mode of performance for another, as a dog can if necessarily, learn to walk on three legs and learning and intelligence. So those are the challenges in accounting for behaviour. OK, quote, An enormous gulf of ignorance lies between all these phenomena and the established facts of molecular biology, biochemistry, genetics and neurophysiology. How, for example, could the migratory behaviour of young cuckoos ultimately be explained in terms of DNA and protein synthesis? Sheldrake then drives two darts into the heart of physical explanation. First, the possibility of dualism. If, quote, the mind were non-physical and yet causally efficacious, capable of interacting with the body, then human behaviour could not be fully explained in physical terms. The possibility that mind and body interact is by no means ruled out by the available evidence. It is possible that human behaviour, at least, might not be explicable entirely in physical terms, even in principle. End of quote. Then the dependence of science itself on mind. Attempting, quote, to account for mental activity in terms of physical science involves a seemingly inevitable circularity because science itself depends on mental activity. At present, the idea that all the phenomena of psychology are in principle explicable in terms of physics is itself no more than speculative. End of quote. In accounting for morphogenesis, he first defines it, then identifies three remarkable problems. Biological morphogenesis can be defined as the coming into being of characteristic and specific form in living organisms. 
The first problem is precisely that form comes into being. Biological systems are epigenetic. New structures appear which cannot be explained in terms of the unfolding or growth of structures which are already present in the egg at the beginning of development. The second problem is that many developing systems are able to regulate. In other words, if a part of a developing system is removed or an additional part is added, the system continues to develop in such a way that a more or less normal structure is produced. End of quote. And he goes on to give examples. Results of this type show that the developing systems proceed towards a morphological goal and that they have some property which specifies this goal and enables them to reach it even if the parts of the system are removed and the normal course of development is disturbed. The third problem is that of regulation whereby organisms are able to replace or restore damaged structures. For example, if the lens is surgically removed from a newt's eye, a new lens regenerates from the edge of the iris. In normal embryonic development, the lens is formed in a very different way from the skin. The only way in which these phenomena can be understood is in terms of causal entities, which are somehow more than the sum of the parts of the developing systems and which determine the goals of the processes of development. Vitalists ascribe these properties to vital factors, organicists to morphogenetic fields, and mechanicists to genetic programs. I think that's a nice um, little analysis. End of quote. He goes on to analyze these positions. Sheldrake devotes to morphogenesis an entire chapter. I'll give a single quote from this chapter. Within the same organism, different patterns of development may take place while the DNA remains the same. Consider, for example, the arm and leg of a man. Both contain identical cell types, muscle cells, connective tissues, etc., with identical proteins and identical DNA. So the differences between the arm and the leg cannot be ascribed to DNA per se. They must be ascribed to pattern-determining factors which act differently in the developing arm and leg. End of quote. The final chapter I refer you to is titled The Causes of Form. It starts, quote, It is not immediately obvious that form presents any problem at all. The world around us is full of forms. We recognize them in every act of perception. But we easily forget that there is a vast gulf between this aspect of our experience, which we simply take for granted, and the quantitative factors with which physics concerns itself, mass, momentum, energy, temperature, pressure, electric charge, etc. Sheldrake goes on to give a nice analysis of the springs of mechanistic thinking, one of which is a mathematical mysticism of the Pythagorean type. The universe is seen as dependent upon a fundamental mathematical order, which somehow gives rise to all empirical phenomena. This transcendent order is revealed and becomes comprehensible only through the methods of mathematics. Although this attitude is rarely advocated explicitly, it has a strong influence within modern science and can often be found more or less thinly disguised among mathematicians and physicists." End of quote. He then explores for us the influence on contemporary biological thinking of Plato's theories of forms. In the next chapter, Sheldrake tackles morphogenetic fields transitioning into his own theory of morphic resonance.